Welcome, friends. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today. And I want to let you in on a little secret. A lot is going to unfold Monday afternoon. And so I really want to encourage you to make sure you're receiving our e-news. And again, you can go online to our website, scroll down to the very bottom and hit subscribe. We're going to let you know a lot about some details that are coming out in June and July and then some other opportunities that we don't want you to miss. So please stay tuned for that. And again, I would encourage you to continue to give. Give as you are able so that we can continue to do just this um, and do the ministry of our church in this community. So friends, let us now enter into worship together. Welcome. So glad you're in worship with us at St. Peter's today. Can't believe it's been almost three months um, since we've been worshiping like this. And just this week, there are going to be some coming back to worship over at the church as well. As we begin worship today, I just want to pronounce God's blessing and God's hope for our time together. First um, word comes out of Philippians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of Psalms. I was glad when they said unto me, we will go into the house of the Lord. So as we've declared week on week now, the Lord is here and his spirit is with you. Let's enter into a time of worship. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Sinner's heart, you lead us by still waters and to mercy. Us 
in the song of your salvation And all your people sing along And so remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, oh God Your grace is enough Your grace is enough So remember
You know, I just love being in a place of worship because as a psalmist said, God inhabits the praises of his people. As I step into that place, I feel the, the love and I feel really the ability to trust that God loves me. And there's a grace in that and there's a goodness in that. And honestly, there's a freedom in that because it allows me to begin to really reflect on who I am without guilt, without shame, without fear, but who I am. And that's what I wanna do this morning. I just wanna take a moment and invite you to a place of reflection at a heart level, at a, at a mind and thinking level, and certainly at a soul level about who you are this morning as you stand in the goodness of God. So I'm gonna pray and I would encourage you just to pray along with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the agendas and the desires of our own hearts. We've offended against your word and your truth. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done. And we've done those things that we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, you are good, you are gracious, you are faithful. Have mercy upon us and restore to us according to the promises and the power of your son's cross, the forgiveness and the redemption and the release from sin. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Amen. What I'd like to do this morning is have a conversation um, with people that I trust, you, people in our church family, regular attenders, people who hang out with us as friends. You know, I trust you enough to have an honest conversation. And what I wanna do is I wanna talk about God's kingdom and the grace and the possibility that God opens up for us to live in his presence, in his kingdom. I've been hanging out all week with a couple things going through my mind. One is from the prophet Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is lamenting in Jeremiah chapter eight the relationship of God's people who know God's heart and know God's word, and particularly the priest and the prophets and the way they're dealing with those around them. The prophet says on behalf of God, woe to you priests and prophets who heal the brokenness of my daughter lightly, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. The other place that I've been hanging out this week is in a book that's entitled Insider Outsider. My journey as a stranger in white evangelicalism and my hope for us all by Brian Loritz. He's a black man, it's been challenging, it's been provocative, at times maybe even a little threatening as I've gone through that book, but it's been good for me. The other thing, one other thing about this week is, I, you know I love to read and I was reading um, some titles of essays and I came across this one title how to be a good white ally during the George Floyd protest and always. And I'm just gonna to admit to you right now, when I saw that, I had a super negative reaction to it. I didn't even read the essay that followed. Because as I consider God and God's covenant love for me, as I consider God's favor and God's love for our world, as I consider God's kingdom, where there's to be no distinction between black or white, rich or poor, slave or free. I do not know any part of God's story that's about anything other than covenant love. I, I can't find it on the pages of scripture. A, a love that is for better or worse. I'm never gonna give up on you. I'm gonna be with you kind of love. A love that always hopes the best and expects the best and works for the best kind of love. God's not looking for allies in his kingdom. He, he doesn't want us as followers of Jesus to think about being allies. Alliances are circumstantially based. Allegiances come and go depending on whether they work for you or not in any given moment. Your story, our story are connected to God's story through a cross. I know that you know, but I just wanna remind you when it comes to a cross, there are two beams. There is the vertical beam and there's the horizontal beam. The vertical beam is deeply rooted, it is grounded, and it brings stability to the cross. The horizontal beam is tethered 
to the top of the vertical beam, making both beams essential for Jesus' death and our salvation. And what is true in the natural is also true in the spiritual. The gospel of Jesus is both vertical and horizontal. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, was telling them, he says, remember what I taught you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. Key words, Paul saying, this is the most important stuff here, that Christ died for our sins, like your sins and my sins, according to the scriptures. This is the vertical beam. It is God's grace. It is God's mercy. It's that costly, self-sacrificing justice that God brings for our sake, on our behalf. We understand truth and mercy and justice and hope and love by being grounded in, cross, in the cross of Christ, in that vertical relationship. We can't even begin to understand how to love our neighbors, how to do reconciliation with neighbors, how to do reconciliation with with enemies until we are grounded in this vertical relationship with God. But all over the New Testament, through Jesus and through the leaders of the church in those early days, what they do though is they join the vertical beam with the horizontal dimension of faith as well. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord our God. What, with all you have, with all you hold, with all you possess, with all your heart, that's the vertical beam, but it doesn't stop there. And then he says, and the second is like unto it. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the horizontal beam. The Bible knows nothing of vertical love, just you and Jesus, that is not expressed, that is not evident in horizontal relationships. In fact, I just wanna give you a couple of examples of what that will look like. It's gonna be on the screen. You're not gonna see my face, you're just gonna see them. Because Jesus first loved us sacrificially on the cross, we are to love others, 1 Corinthians 13. Having been forgiven by the cross of Christ, we are to forgive others, Matthew 18. Having been reconciled to God through the cross, we are to live at peace with all people, Romans 12. The generosity of Jesus extended through the cross is to inspire generosity among his followers toward the marginalized. Matthew 21, these are just a few examples of joining together the vertical relationship that is ours in Christ and the horizontal relationship that we are to have with those around us. So just keeping it real for a minute, we, we just need to acknowledge and I need to say that this past week to 10 days has been miserable. It's been miserable for our country. There is a lot of stuff going on there, but let's just keep it like close to home. It has been a particularly painful, hurtful, destructive, passionate, anxiety producing, you know, week and a half. I don't know if you know this, but the motto of our state, I have it on my license plate on my car is, while I breathe, I hope. And yet this past week in our city, in our community, among our neighbors, the cry was, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. While I breathe, I hope, but I can't breathe. Do you hear me? I can't breathe. I love our state. I, I actually love our low country. I love our landscape. I love our seascape. I like the rhythms of life in our low country. I, I love our culture. And that is where I got hung up all week on that last phrase. I love our culture. I do love our culture, but what is it? you know, that I've had to wrestle with all week at a heart level, at a soul level, at a thinking level. What is it that, that I love and find deeply good about our culture? What, what is it that I'm willing to express love and affection for that is noble and good and, and worthy of affection in our culture? What are those things, those enduring things that I want my children and my grandchildren to claim and to defend and to hold on to in their lives? And what are those things that are not good and noble and worthy of my affection and love in our culture? What are those things that are not worth being an enduring influence in our culture? 
or to be inflicted upon anyone in our culture? What are those things? Do we have things like that? What are those things that should not be tolerated or allowed to even be in a conversation in our culture? What I want to say is when we step into a conversation about these kinds of things, these questions which have been thrust upon us in the last 10 days or so, when you step into those kind of conversations, you don't step into it in a neutral or unbiased way. No one does. Every time you walk into a room, every time you walk into a conversation, you bring a whole lot more with you than just you. Every time you walk into a conversation, you bring history with you, family history, cultural history. Every time you walk into a conversation, you, you bring people and things who have influenced you over the course of your life, that has shaped your life. Every time you walk into a conversation, you bring economic realities and educational realities and all these things that have influenced your life and guess what because that is true and it is true of everyone what you consider normal or acceptable or valuable probably differs from what other people consider normal and acceptable and valuable because their stories have been shaped differently than yours so in response you know what we do we tend to hang out with people who validate and embrace what we consider to be normal we just do it. And in the process, we send messages, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes very intentionally, that you need to bend to my beliefs because I'm not going to bend to your beliefs. And this is going on all over our country right now, politically, socially, economically. And we just need to lean into the fact that this conversation involves you and me. While I breathe, I hope. Hope comes easy to people who live in a place of complacency. Hope comes easy to people who have sat too long in a place of privilege. It's easy to assume peace and hope from that vantage point. But what about people who cannot breathe figuratively and literally? Who cannot breathe economically and socially and racially or intellectually, because they don't have access to education. How do you and I, as followers of Jesus, speak hope, engage in hope with neighbors who bear the image of God, just like you and I do, but who can't breathe? How do you, I, how do you and I speak and engage in hope with people, honestly, if we were being honest here, that, that you can't tolerate, that you have huge disdain for, I mean, you would even maybe even say that you hate. Can there be any hope there? A hope that is rooted, as it is, is for followers of Christ, in the cross of Christ, has to start with you being willing to walk with Jesus in humility and in honesty, an honesty about who God is, an honesty about who you are, and an honesty about who others are. And that's always gonna be uncomfortable. And that's why we avoid those conversations. That's why most of us just play around the edges when it comes to faith, when it comes to pleasure, when it comes to hopes and dreams, because we wanna avoid those kind of uncomfortable conversations. And because it is hard, it's hard for me to intentionally go into places and into things that I know are going to make me uncomfortable, I need help. And that's why this week I called a good friend of mine, Chantel Scott. She's been a friend a long time. She's been a partner um, in ministry. She's spoken at this church. And I processed with her on two occasions, probably a total of three hours or so over the course of the week, about all this stuff that is swirling around us. And I want you to listen to a little excerpt now from part of our conversation. I also think that privilege needs to be used for the advantage. You know, like if, if you know, um, and, and let me just clarify privilege, because I know there's a whole conversation around that, so please let me clarify. To say white privilege is not to say that you haven't experienced any hardship in your life. It's just to say that most of those hardships didn't come at the expense of your skin color. So let's just clarify that, because I know that's kind of a touchy um, topic right there. Tell me how hope plays in or doesn't play at all in 
where we are today this week. Right. Right. So I, I definitely believe there's hope, but I also believe in the active sense of hope, not hope. Whereas we sit back and say, oh, these people will figure it out. This will happen. You know, hope, whereas we're active in being a part of that hope. Yeah. I think the thing I might have struggled with um, all week is, you know, Paul, actually Jesus, but Paul tells us often, like in Romans, that there's no one without sin. Right. Right. Um, so. What that tells me is that simply good intentions, if I have good intentions about doing something, mm -hmm. that's probably never going to change anything right. <laughs> unless I deal with this deeper issue. Absolutely. This, this sin or the systemic issue. So, so how does that conversation get engaged, Chantel? That, that's a hard, hard question. You know, I think um, the, the first part of it is kind of having this openness and this reminder that the ultimate goal is the solution. Um, the ultimate goal is to work towards the dismantling of a system that has oppression. And, you know, because like I said, I think it's hard to for people to feel like it's not my fault. You know, it's hard. And, and that's not what we're, we're necessarily or we would want people to feel, you know, but it's this idea of I have to acknowledge it. You know, even when I look at the black community, we have to acknowledge that trauma for us to get to a place where we say we have to push and have built allies to dismantle the system. So it's the same way on the on the other side of the fence. You have to look at this past, um, you know, this past history of our country, what our country was founded off of in re reality, like the fact that black people were property, three fifths of a man and things like that. And what, what our constitution was founded upon and, and that reality of it to begin to look at ways to, to undo that. So it's not about a blame, but a, an idea of acknowledging so that we can understand what needs to be done. Tell me um, kind of what tends to be the norm in your community or in your life when it comes to trauma and the sense of um, violence or right. injustice. Right. So it, it's this sense of anger. Um, you know, it's this sense of exhaustion. And when you see a lot of the headlines, it's easy to say, oh, well, I don't know that person or I, you know, that's not my city. But, you know, for a lot of black people, we can't do that. And we can't do that because like it's only the grace of God or the sake of chance that differentiates us from being another hashtag is what we say. You know, and, and after these traumas, we have the conversations all over again. My brother's 38. And after every time a black man is killed by a cop in broad daylight film with people filming, she's calling and she's pleading with him. Do not talk back to cops. Do not do this. Remember to do this. She's calling my cousin. She's saying the same things. We're forced to have these conversations. And even though we're never able to heal from the trauma, they're being built on, they're being added on. And these national atrocities have nothing to do with the daily things we experience, you know, like, like being in a group of your classmates, given the, that one of the things I, I disliked the most was being given a group project in college because I knew that I was going to feel excluded. I knew I was just going to be sitting in a circle where I was ultimately invisible to my classmates eyes. And so there's little things like that that you're reminded of. And I'm saying this as someone who um, is, is often, let me be real, realistic, well taken by white people. And I experience this trauma. You know, I have these emotions of things because there's so much that's not known because oftentimes we can't let it be known. We don't, I wouldn't want to be labeled, you know, another angry black woman. You know, I wouldn't want to be unapproachable. Like there has to be somebody who can communicate this in a provocative fashion so that, like I said, the system can begin to be dismantled. That the reason I was able to do this with you and what we're doing right now is because I trust you. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it's uncomfortable at times, even mm -hmm. with our friendship, because what I'm inviting you to do is to help me see myself through another person's eyes. Right. And that's what I really would like you to help us do collectively mm -hmm. as a church is to see and consider our lives through another person's eyes. For sure. So thank you for doing that. tonight. Oh, absolutely. You know, when you say the conversations become a little uncomfortable at times. I think that's so important to say because with your, you know, discomfort in that, I feel a sense of more comfort. And so for when we look at our relationship, the ability to have these provocative conversations allows, you know, me to feel that I'm at a place where there actually 
it's hope, although I always say it's not a strategy, but there's true hope because there are people who are willing to sacrifice and be an open ear and say, look, I know I don't necessarily have to because my lifestyle, I can live without, you know, asking a black woman, well, what's your experience, you know, but still being open to doing that. So I think that's so important and it's, it's the first step, um, you know, to getting conversations started. You know, it's such a blessing to be able to sit um, with a friend who's different in so many ways, but it's a sister in Christ. And to have the trust to actually look at my life and our lives through the eyes of another person. I want to end with a quote um, from Tim Keller after I give you a bit of a challenge. And my challenge is this, that I would encourage you to look for anyone of color, particularly a black person that's in your life, and over the next week, that you would set aside a time, that you would call them, that you would engage them, and just ask them to process with you their thoughts, their feelings, um, kind of what's running through their heart as we navigate this moment, particularly here in the low country, and just see where that conversation takes you. I don't think there's any way to change systems outside of a personal relationship of trust with someone. We just can't do big picture. And, and, and that's what Keller's going to say here in this quote. It's really about that vertical relationship with God opening our heart to the horizontal relationships around us. Tim Keller said this in his book, Generous Justice. To my surprise, there is a direct relationship between a person's grasp and experience of God's grace, the cross of Christ, and his or her heart for justice in the poor. In both settings, as I preach the classic message that God does not give us justice, but saves us by free grace, I discovered that those most affected by that message become most sensitive to the social inequalities around them. And I believe that's true, because I've seen that in my own life. So let's just close in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross so that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. I ask you now to so clothe us by your Spirit that we may reach forth our hands in love so that those who don't know you may come to a knowledge of you. That we might reach forth our hands in love to those who are hopeless and despairing so that we might reach forth our hands in love to our neighbors and by your grace, maybe even to reconcile with those that we were to be tempted to call enemies. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
grateful to have had this time together with you today. And I really believe, I just have a sense that each of us have an opportunity in this moment to take a step towards releasing a hope and a healing that may be missing in the lives of some of our neighbors. And I'd encourage you to do that. If you'd like to hear the rest of my conversation with Chantel, go to our website. The whole conversation can be found there. I would just ask you to continue to pray, not just for our brothers and sisters, but for our own hearts in all of this. And finally, I would say, um, talk to your kids if you have children. Uh, let's just kind of school them up and grow them up in the, the knowledge and the love of God and the freedom to live in God's kingdom where there is no black or white, rich or poor, slave or free that the grace, the gospel of Jesus actually demolishes, as Paul would say, all those walls that divide us. Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Blessings. Yeah.